Hey guys, welcome to another PC Perspective mailbag. According to this number I see up here, this is our 15th mailbag, which is a lot of reader questions to answer, viewer questions, listener questions, whatever you happen to be, uh, we're happy to answer them. Let's just jump right into it again. You know, that joke about picking up my daughter later, or whatever, it's kind of gotten old, so we'll just get to it. Dark Wizzy wants to know, I read that C states decrease performance in some tests, albeit by a small amount. Is this small penalty due to slower CPU frequency ramp up? And if so, would it therefore disappear in very long tests? Uh, so C states, uh, for people who don't know, are the ability for a processor to down clock to lower clock speeds or even into a deep C state like C6, which essentially turns that core off. This saves power, increases efficiency. Uh, this is much more important on notebooks than on desktops, but even on desktops it's used uh, as a way to uh, increase power efficiency. And if you can turn off a couple of cores, you can maybe supply more power to some other cores and get those up to higher clock speeds, that type of thing. Um, C states can affect performance in a negative way if the... Uh, test or application or whatever it is, is very latency dependent, right? So if it's a very quick operation, um, then yes, there's a little bit of a delay for that core to be woken up, clocked to its highest clock rate, get the work done before it'll go back to sleep. Um, so yes, it would be a, a very, very small number in most cases. The importance of that small number will just happens to depend on the test and the workload that you're looking at. So to your question of would it disappear in very long tests, it wasn't. It, did, it doesn't uh, disappear. It just becomes dramatically less important, right? If we're talking about some number of microseconds uh, of difference, sorry about that notification. If we talk about some uh, microseconds difference in wake up speed for you know tens of thousands of very short operations, that's important. However, if you're doing a handbrake encode that takes a couple of hours, then it will be washed out in the in the time it took to you know to do everything else right so and in, in, in reality almost every workload the amount of time it takes to wake up from those c states is going to be washed out in the amount of time it takes for the work to actually be completed even if it's you know milliseconds right so uh c states i think are still you know a, a big benefit they're still um useful to consumers although sometimes in testing and in benchmarking if you're trying to get the absolute perfect metric or you want uh, no kind of variability across testing, you would disable C states. Um, and that's something that maybe Alan does for storage, whereas for us on the CPU testing side, we actually keep C states and turbo modes kind of at their default settings because we think it's more representative of the product you're testing, which is the processor itself, right? So something to keep in mind. Uh, oh, before I get to the second question, if you don't know already, you can leave uh, a question on the YouTube video or on the comments on PCPro.com where this video is embedded in order to have your question answered, maybe, on the next week. So keep it up. Thanks, guys. Uh, Coco Norikos, Co Coco Noriokos asks, in laptops, it seems that the GPU frequently shares RAM with the system. Is it possible to go the other way, i.e. allow the CPU to utilize graphics memory? This would be very useful for CPU-based rendering tasks where the GPU isn't doing much. Cheers from Greece. Um, so what you're seeing in laptops is when you have a CPU with integrated graphics. So basically every Intel core processor uh, that exists in a notebook form has integrated graphics on it. The new Ryzen mobile part that was announced this week has integrated graphics. All the APUs that came out before from AMD have integrated graphics. Um, and there's there's basically two ways you could, you could possibly do this, right? So um, you could have uh, a single monolithic die with a CPU and a GPU on it and two memory controllers. One memory controller to access the DDR4 memory for the CPU and then uh, a separate memory controller for the GPU to access its own memory. Now when you do that, that could be GDDR5, 4.3, you could do HBM2, uh, you, you could basically interface it however you want. However, from a cost savings perspective, both in terms of how you lay out your systems, uh, how, the, how the, the, the processor die itself is laid out, it saves a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of complexity if those two systems share the same memory interface. <clears throat> so what you're seeing is um, 
essentially if your system has eight gigs of memory and uh, a typical Intel IGP might allocate 512 megs of memory to the GPU, uh, if you look in Windows, you will see that Windows only sees seven and a half gigs of system memory whereas that other half gig is then allocated to the GPU. Um, so there's not really an idea of sharing the other way around because there's really no dedicated graphics memory. There's just one uh, collection, one set of memory that is being utilized by both. So even though um, we call it, or some people may call it GPU frequently sharing memory with the system, it's not one way or the other. It is really a, a unified memory system um, that allows those, those two modules, whatever you want to call it, to really access the same memory pool. There, It's always divided out that way because we're still not into the world of heterogeneous systems where these two processors are, are actually sharing the same physical memory locations. Uh, so that's why you get the division of, say, you know, half a gig and seven and a half gigs between your CPU and your GPU. CM asks, do you think that external GPUs will take off in the foreseeable future? Or are the bandwidth bottlenecks too severe to achieve performance parity with internal GPUs. Other than waiting for faster I.O., is there anything that manufacturers can do to make eGPUs more viable? Um, I still think external GPUs will be popularized and be a solved solution. Uh, we're, we're pretty close there now. Like The Thunderbolt capability actually makes this a very viable solution. And uh, Ken has done some testing recently looking at a couple of different eGPU, external GPU enclosures. Um, and we noticed some performance disparity between, you know, a desktop system with an integrated, with a, with a discrete GPU installed in it, and that same desktop system connected to that same discrete GPU through the external dock, right? That's kind of our apples to apples comparison. <clears throat> and, and in those cases, there's still a little bit of a performance difference, um, but it's not super dramatic. There's a little bit of a latency draw there. Um, the problem we've seen is that most of the time these, these external GPU enclosures need to be paired with, or they're supposed to be paired with, um, you know, thin and light notebooks, because that's where you need that power, but you don't have the space or, or the desire to carry it around with you. In, in a lot of those instances, you're talking about a dual-core hyper-threaded processor, say, you know, the seventh generation Intel core parts. And because of that, the CPU becomes the bottleneck causing frame pacing and kind of uh, uh, intermittent frame drops and stutters uh, because of the CPU bottleneck now having to filter through all this PCI bandwidth that it wasn't expecting to have to do. Um, that goes away somewhat when you have a quad core notebook CPU. So I think as as the as the total infrastructure, as the notebook portable systems uh, evolve as they mature, that the external enclosure enclosure uh, ecosystem will improve around it. Right? Nvidia and AMD still have some optimizations to do for that. AMD is actually a little bit a little bit ahead of Nvidia, in my opinion, in that regard. They um, you know, have kind of targeted that more specifically. Uh, although we haven't looked at it since Vega came out, right? We When we did our testing of the external GPU initially, we kind of looked at an RX 580 that did pretty good when paired with these with these notebooks. However, it was a much lower power GPU, so the potential for a CPU bottleneck was less severe there than when we paired, say, a 1080 or 1080 Ti uh, with a dual-core system. So uh, now we've got our 8th gen laptops in with Thunderbolt on them. It may be time to look at that again. Uh, also with Ryzen Mobile coming out, even though they, it has a really good integrated GPU, um, it, it would be worth looking at some of that, uh, that external GPU stuff on there as well. Dan, uh, Daniel Monsanto wants to know, how can the new 6-core processors from Intel match or even outperform the 8-core Ryzen parts and Intel's old 8-core HEDT parts in many heavily threaded tasks? Is it black magic? Cheating with compilers and instruction set advantage? Um, <clears throat> so in, I was going to say none of those, um, the, although the, the ISA, the instruction set, Technically, if an application is using like a, a more advanced AVX 512 extension, that would be one of the reasons it could do it. But take, taking that away from something, if you look at something like Pavre or Cinebench that is not using those um, those extensions uh, and is something that is a workload that has been well known and understood for quite some time, um, the reason is a, a six core Cabby Lake or no Coffee Lake part could outperform an eight core Ryzen part is a more simple discussion, right? So the, the your performance is dictated by basically two properties, your instructions per clock, your IPC, 
and your frequency, right? So your instructions per clock and then how many clocks you can get done in any given amount of time. And the IPC of Intel's core design is still better than what uh, AMD has done with Ryzen and the Zen architecture. Now, again, the Zen architecture is way better than what AMD has had previously. It, it has gotten significantly closer to what Intel is able to do, but it's still not up there. So if you look at single threaded performance at equal clocks, the Intel part's going to be faster. So you take that into account, and then also that in general, these Coffee Lake parts are running at a higher frequency than the AMD parts. So you have better per clock performance and more clocks means that it, in some cases, six cores can outperform eight cores because it's six cores at higher clock rates at higher performance per clock against eight cores at lower frequency and lower performance per clock. So it's all about that balance, right? Now, the, the question of how the six core could compete against or, or beat Intel's older eight core HED parts, it's essentially the same idea, right? There's less of an IPC difference there, um, but there is just basically clock speeds, right? There's a little bit of, of IPC performance delta uh, between, say, Coffee Lake and uh, maybe the eight core part you're talking about is Broadwell E, for example. Um, but you look at clock speeds and sustained clock speeds with uh, all cores running. That's basically where that comes into play. So it's, a, it's, it's an architectural thing in addition to improvements in clock rates thanks to process improvements or better bending or just better design, those types of things. Richard Bierne asks, I'm looking at a home server upgrade. Are we likely to see retail availability of Epic anytime soon? It was announced months ago, but I have yet to see processors or motherboards available to buy. Oh, this is something we've actually been trying to keep an eye on as well. Not that we're going to buy any necessarily, uh, but just wanted to see where these platforms were. Um, you know, we're, we're kind of used to seeing like Tyann or Super Micro Boxes kind of ship with bare bones systems ready for you to drop in processors. We've, we've saw that with Opteron parts for a long time. Um, it just hasn't happened yet. And um, I know AMD is shipping Epic, uh, but their focus is with the customers that have integrations ready to go. So I know they, they've got lots of customers lined up. Uh, they are, you know, sending a lot of hardware to the, some of those you know, super high-end data center enterprise customers trying to convince them that this hardware is going to work for them so they can be, do mass orders and that type of stuff. So it doesn't surprise me that it hasn't shown up in the retail market yet. Uh, I would secondarily ask you if why you need an epic part for a home server upgrade is a you know we did a uh we're doing a story on it now uh, an upgrade to our plex server that also is our file server it does a couple of other things here and we actually used a threadripper part for that um 16 cores 32 threads seems like plenty for any of the functionality that we're going to have with that so if you need more than it hey i don't know what you're doing at your house I, sure whatever um uh, I would say, ask you why you wouldn't look towards something like Threadripper. It's going to be lower cost. It's going to be really, really high performance. Or even if if you need more perf, you can look at some of the um, Skylake X, uh, X299 platforms that go up to 18 cores as well. So um, something to keep in mind. I, I don't know when we'll see the retail availability of Epic, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, I think until you start to see the Dells and the HPs of the world maybe offer a couple of systems available for purchase on their sites, that's when you maybe start to see that the inventory levels are at the point where you may st uh, see things in the channel. So we'll keep an eye on it too. So let us know if you find anything first. Psycho Tech Studio wants to know, why is the CPU speed reported by Windows Task Manager different from what I see in CPU-Z and the motherboard BIOS? Yeah, we have to deal with that a lot. Um, the best advice I could give you is that Task Manager is uh, a general rough idea of clock speed and, and not very specific. We use tools like uh, HW Info that gives us the clock speeds of all of the cores all at the same time in one kind of display. Um, Windows Task Manager tends to want to do some math to tell you like what the the it's not really the average but like what the the clock speed of the whole processor system is right um and so you'll see it bounce around a lot more than than you should and if you look at cpu z it's really only reporting one core uh and if you right click on it you can actually see all of the cores it's just not as intuitive as something like hw info um 
I, I don't I don't trust Task Manager for the clock speed itself. I do trust it for is there activity that is boosting the clock speed up above idle. That's what I'm what I'm kind of looking for in those instances. Uh, but I would I would tell you to use an external tool. Like I said, HW Info is a good is a good option uh, that I know works with all the Ryzen and Threadripper parts as well as all the Intel processors that have come out recently as well. DJ Noob wants to know, while playing a game like Fallout 4, when I look up at the sky, my CPU and GPU usage spikes, but frame rates remain stable. But when I look straight ahead at a much more complicated scene, both my hardware usage and my frame rate drops. This seems counterintuitive. Have you seen a situation like this or have any idea why it happens or how to fix it? So let me see if I can understand this. If you look straight ahead at a complicated scene, hardware usage and frame rate drops. That doesn't make any sense to me. If your hardware usage drops, I would assume that your frame rate would go up. The only thing that that would be the case, uh, if you're looking at something from, say, GPU-Z, if your GPU utilization is actually going down and your frame rate is dropping, then you have a bottleneck somewhere else. It's either in your CPU or in something like GPU memory. If your GPU memory is at its peak, maybe you only have a 2 gig or a 4 gig card, uh, or three gig card, and um, when you look up at the sky, it can release some of that memory. But when you're looking at a complicated scene, it needs to, it's trying to load up more memory than you can. And if the memory system can't keep up, it would lower your GPU utilization, which would then, you know, be an indicator that your frame rate was dropping. Um, that that's pretty uncommon, I would say. Uh, I would check for is your CPU. Go back to the last question: Is your CPU clocking as high as it should? Um, is your memory running as fast as it should? There might be another uh, bottleneck that you're seeing. And you say when you're playing a game like Fallout 4, does this happen to more games or is it only in Fallout, right? If it's only in Fallout, um, that might be something to look at for driver updates or game patches. If it's Steam, you don't really get a choice, but uh, I think you get what I'm going for here. Um, and also, if you have a very low memory, uh, you know, 2 gigs, 3 gigs graphics card, you might try turning down some of your uh, in-game settings and just see if that affects anything one way or the other to help you start that diagnosing process. Uh, Gregor Mima asks, I would like to have at least a 100 hertz refresh rate on my work monitor using for uh, use for graphics and video editing. I'm using an NVIDIA GPU, but thinking about getting a cheaper 100 hertz or higher FreeSync monitor. Can I use my NVIDIA GPU with FreeSync for high refresh rate or do I need a G-Sync monitor? Uh, easy answer here. You can use an NVIDIA GPU on that display to get a high fixed refresh rate on that panel, but you will not be able to use the variable refresh rate technology. So uh, if you're doing it for graphics and video editing, that's fine, right? So if you have 144 hertz display, uh, your, the NVIDIA GPU will be able to push that without a problem. Now, you mentioned 3D in here as well. If you're doing 3D rendering, um, then you don't get the benefit of the variable refresh, you know, and, you know, I don't, I, to tell you the truth, I don't know how G-Sync even works with professional applications, like something like Maya or whatever it happens to be, like a 3D modeling thing, uh, if the, if the VRR stuff even functions. So that's a question mark. I don't, I don't know the answer to that actually. Um, but if you're looking at just a higher fixed frequency refresh rate, that'll work fine on AMD GPUs or NVIDIA GPUs. So, uh, let's see. Here's another one from Monkadelic. Monk Monkadelic? Duh. I don't know. Are there any rumors or speculation about the next generation consumer GPUs from NVIDIA? I'm currently using a GTX 970 and want to upgrade, but I don't want to pick up a 10 series card now, only to have the next update come out in a few months. Upgrader's Dilemma. Um, the, the, the next generation is Volta. We know that it's going to come out at some point next year, but honestly, I don't have any idea if it's going to be something that I don't think it's something they're going to announce at CES. I could be wrong. Uh, even if they announce it, maybe it's not until March that we see it actually released. Um, if you look back to, I'm going to cheat here and uh, go to a browser and make sure I have the right the right time frame here. But if you look at the 1080 launch, that was in May of 2016. So it's actually been a pretty long time, right? So it's it's we're coming up on a year and a half right now of uh, of how long the the, the Pascal based GPUs have, have have been the flagship parts. I, I I think at the very least we'll see 
consumer Volta by May, which I think is enough of a window for you to buy something else now. Um, but I could be wrong. They could they could be deciding that they want to launch this in January, February. So I, you're always going to have this question about when do I upgrade. Um, right now, I think if you can hold off buying parts when the when the cryptocurrency mining craze is there is is a pain in the butt and it makes things more difficult and more expensive. So maybe wait a little bit longer. But if you find a good deal, they just announced a GTX 1070 Ti for what 449 or something today and if you can find one for a pre-order for that price it might be might be the time to go so uh let's see a couple of real quick lavos cracker will 4k at high refresh rates uh say 120 or 144 hertz become realistic anytime soon do you think the ps4 pro and xbox one x will help push amd nvidia to finally finish off 1080p uh i hope so i hope they kill off 1080p uh at least as the dominant resolution uh 4k 120 is definitely a part of DP 1.4, and I think 4K 144 hertz is part of DisplayPort 1.4 standard. Um, I don't, ha I haven't had any indication of any displays that that run that fast yet uh, with 4K resolutions, but that's. I think I think we'll see. Actually, I think the first G-Sync HDR displays that we saw were 4K 120. I believe that's the case. Uh, and they showed those at last CES, which was, you know, as I look, you know, almost 10, 11 months ago now. Um, so I think we're probably getting relatively close to that. Uh, I, I'm thinking maybe uh, first quarter, first half of next year is when we start to see those released. But they're going to be expensive. They're going to be um, probably hard to come by and, uh, you know, more expensive because they're, you know, the, four, the people who want high quality displays are going to want high quality color, HDR. Uh, you know, 10-bit panels, all that stuff. So it, don't expect them to be reasonably priced. Um, will PS4 and Xbox One X help kill off 1080p? To some degree, they will. Um, you know, PS4 Pro can support 4K, but the rendering power it has is, is still somewhat minimal. Xbox One X is much better at that. Um, but still, a 1080, 1080 Ti is going to be faster than what that can do. And we already know that a 1080 today struggles to do 4K, uh, on a PC. So, you know, we're getting closer, but 1080p is still going to be here for, for a little while, guys. LCTR Games wants to know, is now a good time to upgrade a monitor? Or given that monitors are generally long-term investments, should we wait for technologies like HDR to become established? I'm kind of in that secondary mindset right now. I want HDR displays. And so far, I think we've had two come through the, the office and if you notice, you haven't really seen any content around them because we have not been happy with the experiences that they've provided, either in terms of software support, uh, the HDR looked bad, we saw dithering, something to that effect. Um, so I'm kind of in that waiting state as well, uh, where I would love to get an HDR display, an HDR variable refresh display, whether it be G-Sync 2 or FreeSync 2, having the flexibility of, of using either GPU that I have. Um, I would kind of wait, you know, it's October, it's the end of October, it's almost November, I'd say you wait November, December, we see what happens in the first two weeks of January at CES, and then we make a go, no go decision at that point. Yeah. All right, our, our last question comes in from John STF 72 If you changed your names to Ryan Trout, Jeremy Thunderstorm, Josh Walrus, and Alan Parmesano, would the PC Perspective podcast become more popular? Maltavino. Alan wants Maltavino. Um, would it become more popular? I mean, I think it would have to, right? Um, I don't think anybody would back away from our show. It wouldn't become less popular with names like Trout, Thunderstorm, Walrus, and Maltavino. Although maybe. Um, it might be worth it, right? I mean, at this point, we've tried everything to market ourselves. So I think maybe creating characters for for us. Um, <laughs> maybe we could we can use some of that iPhone 10 uh, Snapchat stuff to always apply walrus whiskers on Josh's face when we're on the podcast. You know things like that. I think are, are actually pretty useful. So I'll, I'll keep that in mind, John. Uh, thank you very much. All right, that's all the questions for you guys for this week. If you have one. Constructive or non-constructive, you can put it in the comments to this YouTube video or at PCPro.com in the comments section uh, to where this video is posted. We'll check them 
And uh, we'll have another list of questions for you guys for next week. Thank you guys for joining us. Also, if you like this stuff, if you think it's interesting and useful and the content we write and all that jazz, uh, patreon.com slash pcpro. That's your place to go support us uh, on a kind of a recurring monthly basis if, uh, if you find, find what we do useful or, or beneficial or entertaining in any, any capacity. So, all right, guys. See you next time. Bye. Mm-hmm.